Okay. I'm a, <coughs> I'm, I'm a lot. I'm really loud, aren't I? Um, I think it talks softer. Um, I didn't know this was going to be a lecture hall. I thought we were going to be out with a truck and a forge and stuff. So I'm a little lost. Can we turn this thing down? I talk way too loud for this. <laughs> I'm even echoing to myself. <clears throat> you know, I don't talk softly anyway, so. Uh, what I would, oh, that's much better. How about that? You guys still hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> it's going to be a lot more fun. If you guys, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to reset a pair of tongs, knock the rivet out, put a new rivet in, show you how I go about it. There's a lot of different ways of going about it. I'll show you how I do it. Uh, and then I'm going to take a, a shoemaking hammer, a rounding hammer, put a new hammer in it, the way I do it, show you how to get one out. Uh, and then I'm going to do the same thing with a nailing hammer, go through the steps of doing that. Uh, and the main reason why I picked that subject was I get phone calls all the time about how do I do this, how do I do that. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, how do you trip a foot if you can't put a hammer on it? <laughs> and maybe that's because, and maybe that's because I put tons of hammer on it and I'm used to it. But when I first started competing, um, well, you a little bitty skinny. I noticed some of the guys out there, even today, you a little bitty skinny hammer hand. I can't even hold on to one of them things anymore. But that's what I used to do. Make a little skinny whipping hammer out of it. And I broke them a lot. So, oh, no big deal, put it all in. Oh, I've had guys call me from overseas wanting a driving hammer hand. And I'm like, good God, man, it's gonna cost me. 85 bucks to ship it to you, $20 hammer hammer, you got to have a, I'm like, get a limb and make one. It's not that hard. Make a, just make one. Uh, I'll do that today too. And I talked a little bit about uh, Hooter was kind enough to go out and get us a hammer to rehandle. Believe it or not, I couldn't find one in the shop before I left. And that's that really unusual. Something that didn't need a damn hammer. <clears throat> so I really hated to take a new one. It's just something about taking a new one and knocking a hammer out of it. So this is my, I'm going to look at this as my customer. Or me. I like that handle. But I didn't broke it. So I need to make another one just like it. I always say a hammer is nothing more than a rock on the end of a stick. It's how good you like that stick. Because if you've ever had to put a new handle on a hammer, it don't feel the same anymore. It, it, you won't like it. You just, I, I never have. I'm like, man, I wish I had that old one back. I really, I had it broke in good. <clears throat> so, anyways, I want to do, do the tongs first because I see guys holding. Farrier is so much different than blacksmith. I've got an opportunity over the last few years to go to some uh, knife making stuff. And then here recently, I got to go with a huge group of bit spur makers, which I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the whole thing. And uh, watch people forge. Everybody's got a different way of doing about it and how they set their tools up or if they set their tools up. And you know, you see a picture of a power hammer for sale, an advertisement, and the guy's hands are that wide, and his tongs are on a piece of steel like that, and you go, somebody's going to eat that in a minute. You know they set that up for a picture, because you can't forge like that. You've got to hold it. <clears throat> and I think also, we as farriers, we hold flat stock. So, <clears throat> if you want to hold flat stock and not twist one way or the other, it's got to fit. They got to be set up for 516. Or if you use an odd cake shoe, like there's a lot of cake shoes on the market today, and they're all a little bit different size. I have guys come to the shop, you know, and, and they're like, can you fix these tongs? I go, get one of your cake shoes out of the truck. 
Show me what you're forging every day with it, and then we'll set them to fit that. Because if I set them for 5 6 feet or 3 eighths, they're going to be close, but they're not going to be perfect. So I want to set it. You know why? I got a, when I moved the shop, I had over 200 pair of tongs. I gave 50 pair away. So now I still have 150 pair of tongs of my own. Just for me. <laughs> that seems crazy, doesn't it? But I want to be able to hold whatever I'm working on. So each one of those pair of tongs have a purpose. And I certainly didn't learn to make tongs to sell them. I learned to make tongs because I couldn't afford to buy a new pair every time I wanted to make something new. So um, that's how I set out to do it. Um, and it really, really helped me. I want to see hands. I want to see questions. Because questions is what will make this kick in gear and answer. So if you have a question, I hope we all, and I'll repeat it so everybody can hear the question or try to. If you'll raise your hand, I'll stop and we can talk about it. That makes sense? All right. <clears throat> I got a pair of 3 8 tongs. Piece of 3 8 in there. Oh, um, the guy's helping me put this thing on. I wanted a short piece. I want a light piece. I've seen guys be seven. You know, I said I, I have a young man go out in the truck get me a horseshoe. I'll also take that horseshoe and chop some and chop it off so I have a little bit of piece. I don't want the whole horseshoe. I want, I want no weight out here when I'm setting. All right? That makes sense? Because if I have to grip to hold the weight up, well then I'm going to screw up what I'm trying to do here. So I want a very light little piece. <coughs> um, so my job, I, I don't know, I don't know about anybody else. I'm not even going to start to mention that, but I always lock one side of the tongue. Uh, I have a locking side and a hinge side. And the reason being is if I set these things and I bend that rivet, if that rivet gets a little bent when I'm setting them, follow me when it goes through straight and it sets like that. If it's locked, wherever I set them, they're going to stay. But if it can spin in there, one minute you have a quarter inch pair of tongs, and the next minute you have a pair of three eighths because the rivet has spun around in the tongue. Anybody ever had that happen? I'm sure, I'm sure somebody has. I, I know I have. So don't be afraid of, of taking them apart. Kathy, I need a rivet. Um, I'm going to grind them off and it only take a second. So I'm, so when I'm looking at this, I know I have a locking side and I have a hinge side. So I'm going to grind the locking side off. Let's 
really don't have enough tools. But try to do it. I'll grind it and I'll show you what I did. Flat on flat we have, 
the left is going to pull. Like, for instance, you've seen, I used to make a square head of pair of chalk and take a, <coughs> take a splitter and split, cut it down. Everybody's seen it, but Jay Sharp used to make a pair like that a lot. As far as I'm concerned, they stink for holding anything. Because you got to have the least amount of surface area as possible to actually grab something. So the bigger the hole, the tighter they're going to grip as long as they're flat on a flat spot. So we'll get into that in a minute when I settle. So when I put my lock in there, that riveting, it'll spin on this side, but I'm going to have to force it to go through that lock on that side. Back 
Alright, I'll talk about the water bucket. Um, most everybody's tongs that are on the market, I, I don't know all of them, but I know mine, Jim Keith, several other guys, Roy's, uh, they're 4140. So, 4140 hardens at 1550, 1550 degrees. In this light, we can see that it's hot. But if you were out side of the sunshine, it would look cold. You wouldn't be able to see it at all. And if you hit that water bucket at 1500, and you got about a two, three hundred degree plane there. Uh, you can do it above that temperature, but not as it hits that temperature and starts to fall. I've got them back in the mail that are just spider web cracked from one end to the other. And it's pretty obvious somebody tried to reset them and then poof, what about them. And the next thing that happens, the head breaks off. All kinds of bad things happen. I need a brush too. <coughs> Alright, we gotta wrap this deal up.
you get done with that, lay them over here and dump them, let them cool on their own. Don't get in a hurry. Put them in the water bucket. Let them cool on their own. All right. Blacksmith flies. We could do that, but we don't have a blacksmith flies. I started making tools with nothing more than a hand drill and a, hand, a little hand grinder. Went through several of the hand grinders. Okay. 
in there until it won't go anymore. You just feel it, and it'll boom. And probably here, too. Boom. Done. Kathleen?
But I want to do a few things to the hammer and handle before I do that. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a little difficult here. First thing I do when I buy a new piece of equipment is rip all the safety stuff off of it so that I can get around it. <coughs> so that all this safety stuff pre prevents me from doing long things for going all the way down and all the way back. But I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. I want to, like I said, this is my customer. This is what he likes. Well, I want to return it to him exactly like he said. So I'll go ahead and try to carve a handle like he did. It won't, it shouldn't take long. But I want to get back to I'm 
fixing to turn it around. But I've, I've got my office on now. So, I want to be a little softer. Very soft.
All right, we got the old one out. That didn't take too long. Now, I hate wood company. I hate them with passion. We buy 2,000 hammerheads at a time. And you get them in, you really need them, you got customers waiting, and they don't fit the holes. Well, you do. Well, if they're too big, you mind them. If they're too small, you call and you bitch, but you still need them. <laughs> so you gotta do something. So, I pick, let me see. I want to some. I'll be back, I promise. They said I could go as long as I wanted. Hot dogs are on me. All right. Well, this is. I made a couple of these. One to send to the handle company. One for myself after I cut one and two. And I'm like, well, maybe I could use one of them too. One of, maybe one of the guys that worked for me could use one. So I, I made me one. I mainly made it for the handle company. But to fit, got to fit that. So, I'm pushing pretty hard on that. I got about an eighth of an inch. I, I want this to do or I want to knock this sucker in there. Yes, sir. If you bring nails and your hammer's not working well, is there something you can do that's easier now with the handle out to help a, nail, a hammer and nail better? Or do you do that at any point? Handle or no handle? It, this the shit's good with the handle. It's so much easier like this. So, I should I wish I could show you. I probably can't. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, how many of you ring your nails off? Bring them completely up. How many of you don't? Wow. About half and half. Maybe. Oh. I went down to Don Gustafsson one time and I always rang my nails off. I mean, I grew up shooting horses. I shot my first horse when I was 12 years old. I grew up ringing nails off. That's what my dad did. That's what everybody, any other horse that we knew, that's what they did. Went down to Don Gustafson's and he bent him up. Well, I shot Bronx for a living back then, and my hand was always tore up from some ripping foot away and ripping my hands up. And Don bends him up. And I go, okay, never seen that before. What's up with that? He said, well, the horse rips the foot away. Nails are going away from you. I go, well, that's freaking brilliant. That's brilliant. I'm on that. Right? So, for years, I bit my nails up. Then I got a better clientele, started paying better attention to clinches and going to contests and all that stuff, you know, paying attention to little bitty details. And all of a sudden, I didn't like the way they blocked. When you bent them over, I didn't like the way they blocked anymore. I couldn't get that nice, crisp, clear clinch that I personally was looking for. So then I started making them off again. Then I block them, get the clinch, I'm like, yeah. But I'm such a retard. The near side of the horse, I'll bend them up. The off side, I run them off. So I'd have half of the horse run off. And then sometimes I got so bad, Kathleen would laugh at me because I'd have I'd have the inside bent up and the outside gone off. It just, I lost my, I, I didn't know which way to go, you know. So, all right, glue, oh, no, that's not what I'm going to do. Kathleen usually standing to where I can see her and she's like, don't do that. All right, so I got, It's a 180 grit belt. That's okay. 
okay, not, 220 would be a little better. <clears throat> That's everything I don't like about all this safety stuff. I can't come at it from both directions very well. I think I can do it for the, just for this, but. Right. I want to have one hand steady. I want to come in. I want to push that belt up from that bottom. I'm not cutting anything. I don't want to just go in there blindly. I want to get on the back side of the belt, push that belt up, come all the way to the front, jump my hammer just slightly, cut it on the way out. I can only do that once. I will have it left. I can do it on this side now. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it. So I'm going to come in here. I'll actually push that belt up from the back side. Just a little bit. That way I can get to this middle. Seems like if I started here and worked my way to the center, I already cut too much off. Does that make sense? But like I'm already into the cut when I'm trying to get out. This way, I'm pushing up. I'm going all the way in. I'm going to start cutting. Come out. When I'm out, I'm out. I'm done. I'm not going to get hung up in it. The next thing... So if you're ringing your nails off, you want to be sharp. And bevel that way, bevel that way. The smallest part at the very top. And then sharpen it from here. Normally, if you got a you got one that's just worn a little bit, a lot of times you just come in here and go down this side. You kind of sharpen it up a little bit, take some of the dull out of it. It's going to work a lot better. All right, here we go. Maybe. It's not a lot. Just a little bit. So by drilling that smaller hole in there, I'm actually spreading that wood a little bit. And I drive it in there. I want I want to grind them back. Eight inch can, I'll make it about an eighth inch on top and bottom.
Okay. Are you a happy customer yet? Oh man, great. Thank you, sir. That'll be 20 bucks. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'm expecting it. <laughs> All right, guys, everybody, thank you so much for putting up with me.